less than a month, so still in my probationary period. Um, and so I guess fairly new to uh, to my current role in the DevOps specific area. Previously, um, I worked for, in the ProMap team as the director of engineering. Um, and so I was part of this migration um, from AWS to Azure for our product. Um, and so I just, uh, apparently it's a topic that never gets old um, and there's always learnings for people. So um, I, I was asked to, you know, present on uh, some of our learnings uh, and the journey that we went through. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so agenda for today is just to give a little bit of background to uh, ProMap and Nintex and how those companies, uh, what they do and how they fit together. I'll talk through the journey that we went through to uh, to do the migration. Um, I'll talk through four specific learnings, um, which hopefully resonates uh, with some of you. And that's a bit more, you know, the technical side. Um, and then uh, I'll wrap up with the current state um, of where we're at now. So a little bit about ProMap. Um, so ProMap was a small New Zealand startup, started in uh, around 2002. Um, and uh, but grew quite slowly. So um, I think we had less than 10 employees until you know the early 2010, 2012 time. Um, and so I only really started gaining momentum uh, in the sort of mid 20 teens. Um, it was bootstrapped uh, on on the on no capital injection. So kind of relied on capital. Uh, sorry, organic growth um, to grow which meant that uh, as a New Zealand startup, you obviously got limited cash uh, and you make decisions based on, uh, you know, being cost effective and try not to spend too much and keep in step with, I guess, the, the, the customers that you have and how much money you've got coming in. Um, so that's kind of where we started. Uh, and then uh, a little bit about Promat, the product. Um, so it's process management software um, and the, the key points of it is that it allows subject matter experts to document, share and collaborate on their business processes across the company. Um, and the, the differentiating factor with ProMap is it keeps it simple. Um, so that's the key selling feature. It's easy enough for everybody in the organization to be able to own and manage their own processes. Um, so sort of taking it away from these process um, processes being the, the realm of BAs and external consultants and trying to put that in the hands of the people who actually run the processes. Um, and then uh, has a uh, sort of governance structure over those processes so that uh, any changes that are made can be um, are you know have this review um, from uh, the stakeholders of the process um, so that people are not making changes that they shouldn't be etc. Uh, and then so in 2018 along comes Nintex. Uh, so Nintex is a digital process leader. I've got um, a series of low-code process intelligence and automation products that form a platform. Um, and the key for them is to empower companies to simplify the creation of business applications that connect people, systems and processes uh, to deliver results quickly uh, with no code. So uh, it's a fairly large company, serves more than 10,000 customers, um, including 50% of the Fortune 500. Um, and yeah, it's got over a thousand employees. Uh, so I guess my key point here is that Nintex is a much larger company than uh, the small New Zealand startup that we were, we, uh, we, we were in ProMap. And so a little bit about Nintex and the, and the Nintex platform. Um, so they had a workflow automation um, uh, platform already, but they didn't have any process management capabilities. Uh, well, not, not like ProMap at least. So Nintex wanted ProMap to fill in those gaps on the left-hand side there. Um, so it's filling in those gaps. So it's got a complete platform offering an easy to use, powerful and complete platform to manage, automate and optimize uh, the processes. So I guess the, the, the selling spiel for that is um, on the left-hand side, you manage your processes by discovering, mapping, and sharing them uh, across your process participants, and that's what where you know they, they purchase ProMap to um, to fill that gap in the platform. 
uh, and then that often, often leads to opportunities for process automation. So uh, many processes involve the capture of information. So there's some form capabilities to uh, easily create forms up uh, with responsive design experience for participants uh, to eliminate the paper forms. Uh, this couples with the workflow automation capabilities, which means that you can quickly design the, the applications uh, using advanced logic and rules to eliminate the manual work and interface with other systems. Uh, there's some RPA capabilities to drive, um, uh, to speed up the automating of those mundane repetitive tasks. Uh, and since many processes involve the need to generate documents, there's a document generation um, offering as well to automatically create documents uh, from both unstructured and structured data sources. Uh, and then we've got some uh, e-signing with Nintex Assure Sign, so you can uh, integrate e-signing into those signature-based workflows. Um, and then once you've managed all of that and automated all of that, we've got a lot of information in the system that we've got uh, some analytics um, process uh, that gives you process intelligence over uh, those processes uh, that are running inside your business. Uh, and then I guess just another point to note that, you know, it's, it is a large company, so leveraged by more than 10,000 customers across the globe, and you'll probably recognize a lot of those brands. Um, and so they leverage Nintex for um, having lot, you know, tens of thousands of processes automated uh, with Nintex. Cool, so that's the marketing spiel over and done with. And sorry, I can't see if anyone's put up their hands. Um, my screen keeps on flicking away from that. So um, somebody might need to call out if somebody does put up their hands. No one's done it at the moment. Oh, good. So I'm obviously very clear with what I'm saying. Um, all right, so I'll talk through a little bit about the, uh, the previous state um, that we had in AWS. Um, so when we were a startup, uh, sorry, before acquisition, we were uh, we had all of our infrastructure in AWS, um, and it was pretty standard, I suppose. Um, well, I think of it as standard. So um, we had uh, VPC with subnets and uh, separate accounts per environment, so a pretty good setup there. Um, we do have a monolith uh, running full .NET framework. Uh, and so we were utilizing EC2 uh, web servers in order to facilitate that um, because, you know, that's, there's not that many options in AWS for doing anything different. Um, uh, we had some microservices running .NET Core, so we were utilizing Fargate for that, so having some nice, um, you know, nice orchestration there. Uh, we use Redis as a caching layer, so in AWS world, we had ElastiCache that took care of that. Uh, we use Kafka for our messaging layer, and again, we've got a managed uh, service there in AWS for that, using MSK um, database. We used EC2 instances um, mainly uh, for uh, the monolith, uh, and we use RDS for the uh, for the microservices, and then we use storage for uh, S3 for storage. So pretty um, stock standard, I suppose, set up there. Uh, for a lot of those things. Um, and so uh, Primap was all in AWS, uh, Nintex uh, and all the products uh, within the platform were all running in Azure. And, uh, and so Nintex had good knowledge and practices there. Um, and for us, we had five different regions running in prods um, and we also had test and staging environments as well. So although we had, um, I guess, a fairly stock standard setup, we did replicate that five times uh, in production uh, around the world. So why move? Um, I'll spend a little bit of time here because I think it's worthwhile uh, talking through the the rationale, um, I guess the challenges that we faced in AWS and the rationale for moving, um, just to give you a paint a picture for um, why we thought it was a good idea. Um, so firstly, you know I could break it down into uh, a few different um, uh, do a few different points. So firstly, we wanted to streamline the security and operations. Um, so you know previously we had a startup mentality. Um, where we were kind of reactive to quite a few things um, and didn't necessarily have well-established mechanisms for uh, a lot of practices. Um, so we wanted to adopt uh, the a framework, the framework that Nintex already had uh, for doing things in Azure. Um, so calling out things like we uh, we had SOC two compliance. Um, 
as ProMap, uh, and, but as a type one. We've just lost your audio, Gareth. We've lost the audio, Gareth. Can you hear Gareth? <laughs> you might not be able to see the hands up either. I um, guess I guess he can't hear us because his headphone mics are probably gone. Yeah. Uh, now let's see. I think he's figured it out. Oh, yeah. Anyone's got a private channel to him on an internal chat? <laughs> yeah, I'm just that, trying to that would be helpful. see if that works. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm just sharing with him. He's obviously hopefully spotted that. Yeah, it's, wouldn't, it wouldn't be an event if we didn't have te uh, technical challenges on the day, right? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. It's part of the part of the bingo. Yeah, we we didn't. Yeah, the demo goes are not involved, so we can't blame them. We just need somebody to say you're on mute, and then I think we we're done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, can yep. you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. We can uh, we can edit that out, right? Yeah, absolutely. No one noticed. <laughs> um, I, on Microsoft Paint, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unplug it and plug it back in again. Uh, okay, cool. Um, where do we get up to? Pretty much the start of this slide, I think. Mm. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah, so one of the key points that we wanted to uh, achieve was we wanted to streamline the security and operations uh, practices where, as a startup, obviously, um, it's very rough and ready, and so we had some some uh, decent practices in, in play, but you know, the, operationally, it took a long time to um, oversee those, and we're moving into a company that has established practices for doing a lot of that evidence collection, et cetera, for SOC 2 uh, compliance, as well as all the other um, concerns that you have there. So we didn't really want to reinvent the wheel and, um, and kind of be the silo off to the side doing our own thing, as far as that's concerned. There's a compliance team in a larger company, so so it made sense to uh, you know leverage that um, as well as things like their existing sim uh, and everything else that they had overseeing all the all the things they had overseeing the Azure environment. Um, we wanted to also kind of open up uh, what we were doing in the infrastructure to the larger team um, so that they could also contribute. Um, so more people. Um, and more uh, more knowledge around uh, how things worked. Um, you know, we want to leverage that um, as well as things like the day-to-day -day tasks of onboarding and offboarding users. You know, that for us in AWS world was still quite manual um, because we hadn't came from quite a small team. Um, and uh, with the larger Nintex company, obviously linking into Azure AD and being able to do all that onboarding and offboarding and groups and permission groups, et cetera, all automatically um, made sense um, with the larger company coming on boards, the effort to kind of coordinate that with uh, the other uh, DevOps engineers and other engineers that want to get access into our environments was, um, you know, it was quite a manual and, and painful task. Um, and also the, the production operations team at the time in Nintex had a set of templates and automations, et cetera, that was built around Azure. So we wanted to leverage that and, and um, be able to use those things too. And I guess one of the key things is that, you know, we were on AWS, everyone else is on Azure. And so we couldn't really leverage the knowledge of the other teams. Um, and uh, so we felt like we were kind of this silo off to the side and um, reinventing the wheels that are already kind of been done in the larger company. Um, and also, you know, things like the golden pass that um, the the Nintex teams had come up with, um, you know, we couldn't leverage those necessarily in AWS. Um, and then so we also wanted to um, avoid what we were we thought were AWS limitations, uh, at least at the time with our um, our setup in AWS. And I'll, I'll talk through these a little bit um, to give you a flavor of what they are. So not all these are issues with AWS, but more of a mixture of you know, some 
I guess, limits of AWS as well as our own setup and how we had implemented things in AWS. Um, one of the key things for us was that we had virtual machines, we had EC2 instances running in um, AWS, uh, mainly because of full .NET framework and also because we were running SQL servers uh, in there as well. Um, and we had uh, quite a lot of overhead uh, with those. Um, so we had all our patching and operating system maintenance. We had intrusion detection devices on there, which was some of our larger American customers um, had requested. Uh, Ahmed, have you got a question? Sorry, I meant to start a question, but I'm not sure if there's any music in the background. Is it, if it's just me or? No, I, th I think you're right. There is some music, but I don't know where it's coming from. It might be coming from Gareth. Oh, is, it, is that better? Yes. 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 Oh, I thought <laughs> it was low enough that nobody could hear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that all right? Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Sweet. Um, so yeah, with the with the uh, VMs running, obviously you've got a lot of other concerns around that. So in AWS, um, you know, we had all this patching and um, testing the patches before um, we would roll them out to production. Um, we had issues with AMI baking. I'm not sure if you're uh, people are aware of those terms, but um, you know we would we would bake these images that we would then use for auto scaling, um, and so we would bake in operating system patches, etc., into that, um, and they would they tended to be quite flaky, and so we would we ended up spending quite a bit of time um, troubleshooting and getting our AMIs to bake correctly, especially across regions. Um, each region has different AMI image um, templates, so it's not as easy as doing it once and rolling it out across all regions. Every single region has slightly different images that you've got to use as your base source and then build from there. Um, and then we also had issues with our frying, which is where when we go to scale out, we take a baked image um, and then we've got to apply some additional installation uh, before that can be sort of used for uh, deploying our application code to. And we had this thing where um, there was a couple of agents on the machines that we couldn't uh, put on there during the baking. We had to actually do that uh, as we brought the machine up and it was uh, an actual instance of a machine rather than the, I guess, the, the VHD or the, the AMI that saved the way. So that meant that every time we had to, uh, we wanted to scale, it would take us 15 minutes uh, to build one of these machines and have it ready to be deployed to. So um, that was a bit of a pain. And then obviously with operating systems, you've got the concerns around um, how you uh, allow people to access those and controlling their access to the operating system. Uh, in a compliance driven world, it's very hard to uh, kind of put some restrictions in there uh, once you've got engineers that need to get in and, and figure stuff out. So. Um, so we we thought that was one of the you know one of the major problems uh, or challenges is that we had uh, in the AWS. Um, another challenge was uh, the database servers that we had. Um, our design for the monolith is uh, you know it was from way back in the day, and at that time um, it was designed with a, a single tenant uh, per DB um, structure, which meant that. We, we ended up running thousands of databases in AWS, um, and that has a lot of uh, a lot of inherent issues um, when you're you've got EC2 machines running SQL servers. Um, you know, DR and HA becomes costly and really complex. Um, just even managing uh, multiple database servers to run those things is tricky. Um, we started getting these unexplained um, failures and, and problems with the machines once we started to get up around a thousand databases uh, per machine. So we, you know, we um, struggled a little bit with that. Um, so yeah, so the database servers uh, was, one of the, was one of the things that was kind of Again, another a time suck for um, a company, a startup company that doesn't really want to spend that much time um, caring and feeding for uh, these, uh, these, I guess, this infrastructure that's running there. Um, and then we had a little bit of a, we didn't have as much 
I guess, visibility into application performance um, direct out of the box um, in AWS either. So we, we were pushing data to Datadog uh, for our infrastructure monitoring, um, but we're actually using application insights as well for monitoring our application uh, performance. Um, so, you know, we were actually pushing data out to Azure to be able to um, reference and, and visualize that. So, um, you know, that was one of those things that kind of uh, tweaked our interest in Azure as well. Um, and then the uh, the user management that we had set up, you know, we were using, um, we weren't using Active Directory. Um, and so we had this, you know, I guess user management within the, the production regions was uh, fairly tricky. Um, you know, there was no, there's no cross region um, Active Directory in AWS without you kind of setting that up. Um, with uh, the syncing, et cetera. So um, it felt like it was a little bit, we were managing all of that ourselves um, as well when we've got you know, a larger company that does all that for us. So we would rather utilize that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, Azure's got some quite strong product offerings um, that were on offer. So we wanted to leverage those. Um, we thought we'd take that opportunity to go full uh, platform as a service. Um, you know, that full .NET framework that we were using for the monolith, um, we can leverage the application service plans um, using, um, you know, we had some um, experience using Fargate and RDS and AWS and, and quite liked the uh, sort of uh, uh, the control that is you can hand over to uh, the cloud provider and uh, have to deal with the operating level security and, and compliance, etc. And then also another a big thing that we thought was quite good about Azure was this concept of elastic uh, SQL pools, which means that, you know, we no more of this kind of custom solutions that we had for backing up thousands of databases um, and allowed for more simplified HA and, um, you know, analysis was that it was cheaper in Azure. So, um, you know, it seemed like a, a pretty good bet. Um, and then I guess with the the other thing is the better infrastructure support through having a global company. Um, so, you know, it's spread across the world. So we could have some follow the sun support um, for the infrastructure um, through the teams that are in the other regions. Um, and we've got skills in that platform that are spread across uh, multiple groups and have a lot more people feeding into those good practices as well. So it all sounds like a good idea, right? So what we decided was, yeah, cool, let's move to Azure. Uh, let's go all platform as a service. Uh, so we'll remove the need to worry about operating systems and security and compliance on those. Um, we'll stick all the resources in VNets. And so we'll have the strong network security model like we did in AWS. Uh, we'll utilize application insights much more readily because it's it's there, it's connected, it gives us uh, visibility across the infrastructure as well as the application. Uh, we can link those two things together, um, use all those PaaS benefits like the inbuilt blue green deployments for our monolith, which we kind of had hand rolled um, in the AWS because it was you know more complex with EC2 machines that you got to spin up yourselves and, and be responsible for. Um, and then, yeah, and a little bit, you know, we were using Terraform previously for um, for the infrastructure as code, um, and it was quite separate to do the deployments of those. And so we wanted to bundle that into the applications and the services. When they deploy out, they apply the, the infrastructure changes at the same time. So it all sounds sweet. Um, so what are our learnings? Right, so I'm gonna take you through, um, a few learnings and uh, so yeah feel free to ask questions um, about these um, but uh, so I've got four of them that I'll share um, and I guess the uh, I want to make the point that we we made mistakes along the way and um, so yeah a lot of this is on us um, but it's kind of a learning that we found out in retrospect looking back at it it's kind of a bit of a face palm moment for some of these but um, also, I guess the point of this talk is to help others not make the same mistake as well. So, um, so yeah, so first thing is that uh, to get this uh, separation, uh, this good network segregation and separation, um, we were going to use um, ASEs uh, to achieve this in, in Azure. So AWS has VPCs and subnets and network security groups, and it's got really good isolation sort of out of the box, um, you know, all the 
the subnet, private subnets for backend services were utilized already. We had load balances uh, that were the only things available to the internet. Um, all the network traffic went through security groups and all the subnet routing in place, et cetera. So it sort of allowed for a nice clean structure and easy control for all the services. Um, ASCs and Azure, when we were um, you know, planning this out, seemed to achieve the same thing. Um, so we found you know, they're quite expensive, but they're worth it. Um, uh, and we, so we designed this whole network around uh, ASC and VNet integration. Um, which sounded like a, a really good deal. So, um, and we, what we found is that, you know, the ASCs need uh, resources to be in their isolated and premium tier, uh, which affects a lot of the resources. And so ended up, you know, having to be up a tier um, for uh, for this, a lot of the resources. So things like Redis, for instance, running on um, a P1, a premium tier um, as a minimum. Uh, it's costly, uh, but again, we made that decision that yeah, it's worth the worth the investment, um, even in our smaller regions that don't necessarily need the grunt of uh, a, a premium tier. Uh, Redis Cash, for instance, will still will bite the bullet and will implement that. Um, and so this all sounded honky dory. Did the design uh, looks all good? Um, and then what happened is we built out a testing environment and you know working through the the projects. And um, I, late in the day, we kind of found out this issue um, that we was was new to us uh, that the ASC scaling times were just uh, really really long. Um, so in a, in a, Oh, was that somebody? Uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, and we only found this out once we'd already built uh, built our um, test environment, and we were running our um, load testing to test the auto scaling out. Um, you know, doing the initial designs, auto scaling is just a given that in in a in a cloud environment, um, using app service plans, you can scale nice and easily. Um, and uh, and so, uh, but what we found is that you know it would take 45 minutes and you know sometimes hours to actually scale out just one more one more host um, and uh, it took us a long time to accept the reality of that you know we we actually raised Microsoft support tickets thinking that something we were doing something wrong um, and then in the it turned out that we you know we had to actually redesign our whole networking model to um, to utilize um, VNets differently but without the ASCs so that was a real learning that um, I guess, you know, reading the manual and <laughs> very carefully, uh, you know, and reading some of the documentation around the scaling times, you know, they, they talk about a really short five second scale out, etc. Um, and so I found that the documentation wasn't really as explicit as it could be. In retrospect, looking back, you read it and you go, ah, yeah, I actually see that they do say it and they mention it. But, um, you know, at the time when you're designing things out, um, it wasn't necessarily as obvious uh, to us. Um, and so I think, yeah, one of the key learnings there is to sort of document, document these assumptions as you're doing your design so that you can um, you can share them and people can comment on them on them and you can test them out prior to uh, to actually getting too far down the track. Um, also POC early and test as many complexities as possible. So um, with us, you know, you want to get past the design, it looks good. Um, but, you know, there is um, a, a good uh, a good need to test out some of those assumptions and, and POC, uh, POC it so that you, you can have that assurity. Uh, the other lesson or learning that we found is, and maybe that's partly because of our lack of understanding of Azure, but um, you know, the impression uh, is that AWS seems to have everything locked down network wise. Uh, so network segregation, et cetera, is all built in. Uh, you kind of get that as your starting point, whereas in Azure, it's a, it seems to be a lot more free um, and open. Um, and so I guess network is quite important and a lot of things depend on that. So spend the time to design your network properly uh, and test your restrictions early. Um, the uh, and yeah, another lesson that we'll learn, but I'll cover this in a later slide is uh, there is some scenarios where in Azure you tend to it seems like you need to open up um, your resources to more uh, more to have more access than you would otherwise like on a network level. So um, be aware of that. Um, 
But just to close that off, um, I think as we were working through that with the ASCs, you know, we were using ASC V2s um, and, you know, we did have the support case with Microsoft and, um, you know, they were they were talking about the ASC V3 that solves a lot of these problems. Um, and so I understand that that scaling time, et cetera, has drastically improved. Um, but at the time, yeah, that was one of our learnings that we kind of got bitten with. Any questions on that? Nope. Move on. Sweet. Okay. So Kafka. So Kafka is one of those um, those things. Kafka, Kafka is what we were using for messaging between our services. Um, we actually introduced Kafka um, after we were uh, acquired by Nintex. Um, and uh, so we made a, quite a conscious decision to go with Kafka as it was cloud agnostic. Azure and AWS both have a managed Kafka implementation. Um, and so we uh, thought that the the migration would be easy. Um, you know, so we didn't really put too much investigation into it. We knew that there was managed um, Kafka on both sides. Uh, and so when we actually implemented Kafka in AWS, we went, yep, cool. Um, Azure's got managed Kafka as well. Uh, so we will just uh, implement this. And then if we do need to migrate in the, at a later date, then I know it'll be fairly easy. So what do we find? Um, so it turns out that Azure Kafka is uh, not actually Kafka under the hood, but it's a wrapper around event hubs, um, which does mean there are differences between um, what you get on a vanilla Kafka versus uh, what the implementation in Azure is. And for us, um, we we had uh, a set of microservices, but by all means, we didn't have a lot. Um, and so we had uh, about 30 topics going that we were sending messages on um, in Kafka. And the limits around how many topics you can have um, or event hubs you can have per event hub um, in Azure meant that uh, once we planned out how we would build this, turned out that uh, we would have to move up to a premium tier for these um, and the cost of those jumped significantly. So I think it's, uh, I did that check the other day, it was like 48 times the cost of a premium tier um, event hub. So that's not insignificant and would end up costing us around seven times as much as uh, we were spending in the AWS. Um, we could get away with multiple standard hubs, uh, but again, that adds to the complexity. So uh, if you times that by the five regions that we're running in production plus test and staging, um, you know, that would actually either add a significant cost or complexity to our, um, to our setup. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, we re-evaluated re the, the messaging services in Azure, found that service bus was actually a better fit for our usage and what we wanted to do for our service communication. Um, and so we had to bite the bullet and refactor our services uh, around using service bus rather than, um, than Kafka. Um, so this brings with it some challenges as well. So service bus is not quite the same as Kafka. Um, and so it did require a number of changes, most notably uh, the change around um, the message ordering that we did for a few types of message topics. We did rely on uh, the ordering. Uh, and so we had to kind of, uh, again, found out in testing that, um, you know, this was actually causing us issues. And so we had to go and implement uh, the service bus sessions in order to achieve uh, that, that ordering. Um, of the messages and service bus. So learnings from this, um, again, read the fine print um, because uh, there, or actually do uh, do investigation, don't take things as on face value, especially if they are a kind of an implementation in a cloud platform of a um, specific technology. Um, use native if possible would be my takeaway from that. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I'm not sure if everyone shares that same, but I would think that using extractions is good or okay if you made it as a clear decision, um, but you know, be clear on making that decision rather than just um, accepting that. Uh, that. Um, so you know, it might be good to make that if it's for, uh, you want to be cloud agnostic or uh, you want it for short term so that you can get the migration done and then uh, and move on uh, later. But um, a lot of the time you'll find that um, those 
uh, implementations might be poor cousins to the original implementation of um, of that. So, you know, we following on from that, we you know picked up um, using Cosmos DB as our um, our NoSQL store, and uh, you know we we toyed with the idea of using MongoDB as the wrapper because it's again agnostic, etc. But um, you know we made the decision to go straight with just Cosmos because um, we didn't want uh, the potentially the limitations of uh, what you might find through a wrapper around uh, a technology. Cool. All right. Third one, Azure SQL is just different. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, I guess, we were a group of uh, engineers. Uh, so not necessarily uh, we didn't have any SQL DBAs or anything in our in our team. Um, and so we'd obviously build up this uh, SQL environment that we had running in AWS. Um, and uh, so, and as I said before, our monolith was running a single database per tenant, um, which I understand is outside the norm. Um, and and I know it's not ideal, um, but we were, you know, it was something that we couldn't architect away from um, in, a, in a timely, uh, fashion and actually, you know, that's something that we're we're probably stuck with for that uh, for that monolith until we we split that up and move that into microservices. Um, and so, what we found is um, that the in Azure, uh, the backup and restore um, CLI commands uh, sometimes invoke the Azure subsystem um, to do the work on their behalf. And that requires network access to your SQL Server. So previously, as I talked about, we would like to have these, you know, lockdown um, subnets so that we could have some tight control around the networking to things like our backend services being SQL Server, etc. Um, and with our database, with our uh, monolith requiring a database per tenant, we had to have these functions to automate the process of setting up new tenants, etc., for us, which required um, calling some. Um, some Azure CLI commands from these functions. Uh, we thought, yep, sweet, cool. We can um, we can allow list these functions so that they can uh, you know call the SQL Server. Um, but it turns out that they're actually invoking Azure um, Azure uh, underneath uh, the covers, and so it's the Azure subsystem that's actually uh, trying to connect to your your database servers and and actually perform those actions. Um, and so it meant that you know we had to for certain things we would have to open up the, all the Azure IPs uh, to have access to our database servers, um, which is not something that sat very well with us. And we um, we tried to get uh, find a way around that. And um, in the end, uh, subsequent to the initial implementation, we um, we went back and redesigned how we actually create our new tenants up. Um, so that we didn't have to do the same restoring process that we did that invoked the, the subsystem, but it was not an easy task and it required us changing, um, you know, our tried and true practices of how we actually did our tenants um, set up the new tenants, um, which we had we had previously automated. The other thing that took me by surprise. Uh, the other thing that took me by surprise was uh, the difference between a, uh, a normal SQL backup and the the backpack and deck pack um, concept that Azure SQL uses. Um, so we had some real issues with, um, again, it's down to our uh, architecture with thousands of databases, but um, you know we had some real issues with this the slowness to restore. Um, so again, this is something that runs on the Azure subsystem. So you're at the mercy of other things that are happening in the Azure Azure region. Um, so uh, we had, you know, during migration, we had one database that took us two days to restore um, because it would just fail multiple times. And so you'd set it running, it would run for hours uh, and then end up failing. And um, so, yeah, so that kind of, we didn't really anticipate something like that, uh, given our experience previously with um, using back, backup files um, and, and the ease of that. Um, and then also, you know, the concepts around backpacks and backpacks that they're not a snapshot in time, but they are taking the transactions over time. So it's, it's, um, it's quite a different concept to a straight snapshot backup. Um, and so that's something to be quite aware of. 
Um, <clears throat> talking about the the restores and performed by the Azure subsystem, um, you know, I think one thing to note is that region selection in Azure can be quite important. Um, so what we were bitten by was we were one of the regions that um, we were using, and Nintex is um, in this region as well, which is why we're we're using it. Um, was the West US region. Um, which was nearing capacity. So in order to do our migration, we, you know, we had to actually submit quota requests uh, to get our quotas updated so we could have more databases in the regions, which kind of is a little bit of a, it points to, um, you know, some potential little things in the back of your mind saying, mm, is this a good idea? Um, you know, so the West US region is is nearing capacity for, for that type of thing. So they're trying to control that. Um, and so the knock-on effect of that is that, you know, these restores that were taking a long time is because these regions were being hammered by, um, you know, being near capacity for a lot of people trying to access the same subsystem at the same time. So um, so be, be conscious with your region selection because um, it can turn out to be quite important. Um, the other thing with Azure SQL and the Elastic Pools is that we found that the throttling per database is actually quite aggressive. So we were, um, you know, we could have 500 databases per pool. We thought this is cool. Um, we'll do a randomized. We didn't have any, I guess, that great uh, knowledge around the particular usages of any one database on our uh, current setup. And so we decided to randomize the databases as we migrated them across to get a good mix of large versus small um, and, you know, high usage versus not. Um, and what we found is that we set our um, our limits per database to be uh, fairly conservative. Um, and it meant that the larger tenants that were actually hogging a lot of resources end up being throttled quite hard. So once um, once they hit that limit, uh, then the Azure SQL tends to throttle them quite hard. And it meant that we ended up having some um, some tenants that were not so happy with the performance they were getting out of, uh, out of the system, uh, mainly pointing back to the database. Um, and again, that's a learning for us down to knowing knowing your load profiles down to individual database levels, um, I think is quite important. Um, and then the other thing, last one is uh, the migration tools. So Microsoft's got some good migration tools to work out any discrepancies between your current database setup and schemas, et cetera, whether they're compatible um, and what size you should be aiming for once you do your migration from an existing uh, database setup. Um, so we found them really good for uh, giving some of that info, um, but you know sometimes the estimates for the database sizing particularly um, didn't really match uh, what we wanted. So all our costings, et cetera, were done based on um, the sizes that were suggested by the, the migration tools because um, they sit there and they, you know, they monitor your current databases uh, and database servers so you can get a gauge of, um, you know, what you're likely to be in for when you, uh, or what scale to put on the databases when you get into Azure. Um, and so we ended up, once we were in Azure, um, we chose vCores um, database servers for uh, just the control that we have over. Um, DTUs still baffles me, like how you work out how, how many DTUs you're supposed to have. Um, and also the vCore is allowed for reserved instances, so that seemed to, to work better for us. Um, but what we found is that once we, we migrated, we actually had to scale up uh, one of our regions to meet the demands that was placed on it. Um, the and, uh, and so that was obviously now set to a cost that's much more than we had anticipated and um, kind of changes that balance of whether or not it's a good idea, was a good idea to move into that. Um, so learnings for us are elastic pools are great, um, but be careful with your database uh, per database limits. Throttling can be quite aggressive. Um, and uh, so the noisy neighbor syndrome, um, you know, there's no silver bullet for that, but you need to kind of know, know your profile ahead of time. Um, PaaS is great uh, if you do stuff, if you do everything the same as everybody else. So um, I think where we got bitten with the elastic pools is that we were we had you know these thousands of databases we had specific ways of going around uh, going about how we did things um, and so we uh, we you know you kind of reached the edges of the PaaS 
what PAS offers you fairly quickly if, you, if you're doing things in a different way. So um, be very careful of um, trying to use PAS to solve something that you are doing different to everybody else because there may be unintended um, unintended or, or unforeseen um, little gotchas underneath the covers that uh, you'll only discover once you start to actually do your thing in your way. Um, and then uh, the other learning is once we've now got more insights into the pertinent usages of the polls, we've become much better at being able to tune specific queries, etc. Um, and identifying those things that are actually causing the noisy, noisy neighbor rather than, um, you know, it's not necessarily one, one customer is doing a lot more stuff, but um, just their data shape, et cetera, can cause some inefficiencies to become right to the fore. Right, and then last one, um, beware shiny new things. Buddy's not here, eh? I can bag him. Yeah, cool. Um, but he's not the Igor is, so you can bag him. Igor <laughs> uh, <laughs> knows all about this. Um, so yeah, beware shiny new things. Or should I say, beware people who want you to use shiny new things. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is uh, Azure front door. So was new and shiny. Uh, the Provoke team that were helping us were quite keen to use it. They hadn't used it before. So on paper, sounded perfect. Uh, you know, it's a lightweight bundling of WAF and traffic manager. Um, and as we were just starting in Azure, it kind of felt like it was reducing the complexity down because we didn't have to learn new, you know, a bunch of new resource types. We were just, you know, dealing with the front door to do those things for us. Um, we had very limited uh, WAF. We didn't have any WAF actually when we were in AWS. Um, and so these concepts were fairly new to us. And so kind of reducing down the complexity seemed like a good idea. Um, what we found was that um, Front door is a global resource, and we were we wanted to um, make each region autonomous, and so we had designs that we have a front door per region, um, which again is one of those things that the PaaS PaaS um, service, and uh, I guess we're kind of using it differently to um, uh, the intention, given that it's a global service, we're we're deploying it per region. Um, and even though each of our regions are pretty much the same, they're not exactly the same. And that's where our sort of problems come in, I guess, where uh, we uh, mean that having a global template for our front door is a little bit tricky um, because it deals in domains and validating of those domains. Um, if you've got differences in your domains across your regions, then uh, you may find that causes you a few issues. Um, so for, in our case, we've got some services that only exist in one region. Um, so they're kind of our global. Um, so for instance, we've got a system where we store uh, the, you know, at our, we call it our tenant registry, which is our tenants across all the regions um, so that we can keep track of licensing, et cetera. And so uh, they exist in the US region only, which means that we need to, um, you know, front door needs to be aware of these and have domains for those um, and talk to backends for those, but the other regions don't. And so having a global um, uh, template um, and then trying to deal with differences between the regions uh, becomes a little bit different difficult um, and that means that sometimes we get these outages um, when we do deployments and uh, and that's when it's doing the DNS validation um, and strangely uh, the deployments to front door can also take varying amounts of time so you know sometimes it can take um, you know quite a long time and you know and so you can have this extended outage if you're doing a deployment to front door so we've become very conscious of doing deployments to front door and avoid it um, if we can um, and, uh, and very much manage those whenever we do do them um, what else have i got here yeah so that pretty much sums it up um, and then the other thing with the front door is the that's a bundling of traffic manager and, and the WAF um, but it's not uh, a true bundling, I suppose. It's cut down versions of things like the WAF. So um, the REF's WAF rules engine is not as full featured. Um, so things like filtering based on URL, et cetera, um, are not, uh, not possible in the front door versus you know, your WAF, you've got a lot more control around that. So tuning WAFs, I don't know if anybody's ever done it, but um, 
very time consuming and um, when you've got restrictions around what you can and can't do, that becomes quite difficult. So it took us quite some time to work through those WAF exceptions um, and, and tune the rules. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess that whole, and I another thing is, uh, because it's this bundling, it becomes sometimes Googling and trying to find the information you want, you're always presented with the the information about Azure WAF, which all sounds good, um, but it's not necessarily the same implementation that front door would implement for the Azure WAF. So um, it can become quite tricky to uh, find the information that you want um, on the interwebs. Um, and then, so yeah, rough learnings are, you know, there are some rough edges for new things. We had to use PowerShell to complete some of the deployment steps, um, which, you know, is something that's not ideal um, when you've got ARM um, for everything else. Um, so, you know, as they are building these new things, uh, not necessarily all the, the functionality is available through every avenue. Um, so be conscious of that. Um, but also always kind of reflect back on uh, those things that are new because they do change quite quickly. Um, and so that will get better over time. Um, so, yeah. Right, and then to wrap it all up, just because I didn't want to end it bagging Azure, because I know that everybody loves Azure. So, um, so where are we at now? So we are, what are we, like a year and a half or so in? Um, and, you know, we've now at the stage where we've got a nice stable environment in Azure. Um, our uptime SLOs uh, are being met. Performance uh, does require consistent oversight, but uh, all in all, it's it's in pretty good condition, um, even for the monolith. Um, the auto scaling's uh, a treat, works in the blink of an eye. Uh, the auto healing of some of that stuff that is unforeseen um, seems to work quite well. Um, the teams, um, you know, our teams are now enabled to be able to get into Azure to do what they want to do. Um, we've, we're implementing the um, just-in-time um, access into production with approvals, etc. So that's really helped to sort of spread that load around the team and get that visibility into um, into the environments without the, I guess, the real. Um, overhead of having to manage users and, and um, all that sort of thing, as well as the training and the development for the teams um, through Microsoft is really good. So it's really helping them to become, um, you know, uh, across what they've built so that they can uh, support them. Um, with the, the larger company, we've got, you know, more, more people to help us um, with uh, the things that we're struggling with, you know, others that have done just that. Um, you know, we've got uh, things like using Kubernetes on the roadmap um, and we've got skill set in the company that we can utilize. Um, we're utilizing all those shared things like the SIM and the security controls, etc. So there's teams in the company that look after that sort of stuff so we don't have to do it anymore. Um, we've got a whole DevOps practice that uh, feeds in best practices and, and golden paths and guidelines. Um, and so, yeah, so Azure has kind of allowed us to uh, allows us now to level up on what we've we've implemented. Um, so we did want to go in and and when we did the migration, do it in a way. You know, for instance, Kubernetes. We didn't want to um, sort of bite off that at the same time, uh, learning that whole technology. So um, you know, we took the took the um, the chance just to migrate onto ASPs, which has a limited lifespan for being able to control our microservices as we build out more of those. Um, and so Kubernetes is the next step, and Azure offers that as a um, you know as a good step. And so now we can start to explore that um, and get more advanced in how we manage those. Um, and just you know, I guess calling out, um, you know, we added a new region um, to our service. Um, in the in December and you know it was very little effort it was just add some more parameter files in and hit the go button pretty much not quite that simple but you know so it's um it's uh it's at the stage where it's all um able to be you know do what it's supposed to do it says it does what it says on the tin so um so yeah so we're in a pretty good place now so it's not all doom and gloom uh, and then, yeah, just last slide to say thank you uh, for listening and um, and we're hiring because everyone's hiring, right? So come join us. Uh, that's it. 
Great, thank you, Gareth. If uh, anyone's got any questions, feel free to. Uh, oh, I can see Moses. Gareth, do you want to unmute yourself, Moses, and just ask ask the question? Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Gareth, for uh, for this interesting um, uh, session. It was it was really helpful. I uh, learned a lot from it. Cool. Thanks. Just a quick question around the um, web application firewall. Um, because currently I'm implementing the publication firewall and I'm getting a lot of false positive, especially from the SQL injection rule. Mm -hmm. So did you guys get any issues with that? Or and if if you did, like how did you deal with it? Do you disable the rule? Do you change the um, default action instead of block to log and then reassess? Did you end up refactoring some code? Yeah, so we did basically. Yeah, so lots of false positives, and um, and that's what I sort of alluded to before that the WAFs are just time consuming and they do take constant feeding and nurturing. So, um, what we have done is I, we we put it into logging mode for those ones that are false positives, so that we can evaluate the the stuff that is valid and stuff that is not, and pick up what is. Um, you know what makes it valid, um, and then we create new rules that um, you know allow. Um, well, ideally, what we could do is put exceptions into the rules that are there, um, and but that's what we struggled with with the front door is that you know we had limited ability to put exceptions in that were meaningful. So, so we have ended up putting in additional rules uh, that allow the, the good traffic. Uh, that we know is good um, while keeping the the block rule in there. So that's how we have addressed it. But um, it's a very much a case by case. Every every um, you know every block is kind of slightly different to the last one. So you've got to actually spend the time and go through those. Unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was cool. I was just curious. You said you engaged Microsoft support a few times, um, mm -hmm. and, and on the new services, I just wanted, was curious how the experience was and were they good or yeah, how was it? Am I free to speak freely? <laughs> yes. Um, it was interesting because we'd come from AWS where we found the support really good in AWS, where quite often you'd get to an engineer fairly quickly who would be able to uh, investigate and answer your question quite uh, succinctly and well. Um, we find we found, especially during the migration, where we I guess we had quite a few issues. There was a time where we would have like twenty support cases open at a time, and um, we did struggle a little bit around, especially with the Microsoft support time zone. Thing, you end up getting a lot of noise for very little um, actual content um, with some of the support, uh, support answers. Um, it feels like you kind of go through these levels of support where you start with very stock standard responses uh, and it takes you can take you days to get to, uh, you know, getting down to the crux of what the, the issue is. So um, it, it depends on which support engineer you get, I think. Um, I find a lot of the time if you do the, the chat, um, is a lot better than uh, via email because it seems a lot you you kind of can get something sorted uh, quite a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of Microsoft support at this stage. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Moses. I think you've got your hand up again. Or is that the old one? Yes, that's uh, the same, Moses. Um, uh, Gareth, just a, a quick question around. I've got this impression um, during the session. Of, I was like, okay, that's a, that's a .NET application it was built using the Microsoft stack, like SQL Server and .NET, and um, and it, and it's on AWS. So obviously, moving it to back to you know Microsoft Azure is going to be like you know has a free integration since it's you know like a, a Microsoft stack application. But you know, after watching the session, it's, it, it was it wasn't you know as as I as I expected. So can you elaborate on that? What wasn't as as expected? Are like, you 
I, like I told the migration from AWS to to Azure, especially for for a for a for, a, for an application that was built using using like a Microsoft technology is going to be much way easier than that. Than that. Uh, you're saying so if you had a migration of a um, an existing uh, application that was running all Microsoft technologies, then would that be easier to migrate into Azure? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, yes, I would assume so. And part of the reason why we thought migrating to Azure was uh, a good idea was specifically because, you know, the, the support for the Microsoft frameworks, um, et cetera, in Azure, that's what they do, right? So uh, AWS is not, their, their core focus isn't necessarily on um, Microsoft stack. So um, you get a lot of the solutions in AWS you'll find are not necessarily geared towards .NET um, and, and Microsoft stack. So, um, you know, for instance, that's why we're using EC2 machines um, for our web servers because uh, the Elastic Beanstalk didn't quite suit, didn't, you know, suit what we had. Um, so I think, yes, if you were moving straight from, you know, all Microsoft stack into Azure, then Azure's got good, um, good support and good tried and true ways of doing things for those. So it's a much, you know, it's a it's a nice simple step. Microsoft's quite good at, at guiding uh, and having documentation around that. So, um, yeah, I would say that that would be much easier. It'll, it would be harder if you're moving things that are non Microsoft stack. Uh, then you've got, I guess, a, a few more decisions to make around whether you uh, migrate like for like or whether or not you um, investigate what the options are in Azure and you refactor your code in order to leverage those things. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Hi, I'm here. Hi, I've got a question if no one else does. Um, I'll go next then. Um, obviously, there's things move on, as you've kind of mentioned a couple of times. What's the plan for keeping up to date with things? Is that something your team's going to manage, or is that something the, the wider you mentioned the DevOps practices, that's something they're going to manage. It's a bit of both, right? So the the wider DevOps practice has multiple concerns across multiple products and each of those have got different needs as well. So um, their core focus might not be necessarily on uh, the specific technologies that an individual product is using. Um, so the there's we've got the way that we work is we've got embedded DevOps engineers in the, the product teams. And so they're kind of responsible for uh, being those subject matter experts for the particular products. Um, and they're part of our DevOps practice. So they get sort of, um, there's information exchange between, uh, you know, the central practice and the embedded DevOps engineers as well. So if there's particular um, problems or challenges or roadmap uh, initiatives that a particular product team wants to work on, um, effectively, you know, they can uh, investigate or engage a uh, central team and, and um, what we're doing is we're trying to build out sort of these golden paths for um, a lot of the technologies that we use as a group so that we've got some tried and true ways, you know, if a product team wants to solve a particular problem um, and other teams are already doing it, then we've already got some tried and true practices. Um, and they can also, you know, investigate whether there's better uh, better options and then feed into that same golden path as well. So um, we kind of split it between, you know, central initiatives as well as individual product teams being able to investigate and um, and go on that path and feedback into the central practice. Cool, thank you. Um, any other questions, folks? Kirk, go ahead. Cheers. Hey, um, thanks, Gareth. That was actually really informative. Hmm, thank you. I've actually got a couple of hypothetical questions. For you, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, first one is if you were running, um, say, a, an open source stack like Node, et cetera, instead of .NET, would you still have made the decision? I.e., would the support of Nintex's team still made the move to Azure the best decision? And then the second loaded question is um, let's pretend that you weren't taken over by Nintex, would you have found value in moving to Azure just because you run a largely, well, the Matlab model is in a MS stack? Mm. Um, the, uh, 
So an answer to the first one. Um, so we, if you got open source, so the Nintex, a lot of the other Nintex teams actually use Node as well. Um, so I guess in our case, it would have been a, a fairly simple um, decision that yes, um, you know, they've got tried and true practices. We get lots of leverage through having uh, central teams to manage, you know, the user management, security, all that other stuff. So um, I think yes, we would have still made that same um, same decision to to move. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second question? Loaded question. <laughs> the second question was um, if Nintex hadn't taken over, but you were running your Microsoft ah. products, would you still have made the move to Azure eventually? Do you think? No, I mean, on we we were quite. Although I kind of painted a picture of AWS, you know, a lot of the problems we had was because we were a small startup and we didn't have a security team who, um, you know, had some guidelines and and practices and did a bunch of that stuff for us. So the struggles that we had, a lot of the struggles that we had, we probably would have had in Azure as well because we would have had a setup that didn't really allow for. Um, some of that easy, um, you know, the ease of things that we currently get with a, a, a larger team that helps us with some of that kind of non gotcha. uh, development team. You know, we want to concent we were wanting to concentrate on development stuff and and treated the other security and compliance, et cetera, as a distraction. So I think we would still have that same issue even in Azure. We'd have to figure out what would work for us in Azure and, and build those things out ourselves. Great. Hey, thanks a lot. No worries. Cool. I think that's it. Is it? A final call for questions then before we wrap up. Cool. Mm -hmm. well, so thank you, Gareth. A pro tip for everyone if you are looking to use a new service, go on the user voice and feature requests because they're usually quite insightful for what's missing and what's not <laughs> documented. So yep. I'd, I'll leave you with that tip, I think. Um, otherwise, I say thank you, everyone, and thank you again, Gareth. Um, and we, are, we will be in touch with regards to the next meetup. And then final point is we are looking to run a Lightning Talks meetup soon. So if you're thinking about getting to speaking, then please do get in touch, and we can probably help you um, for that session. But otherwise, Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, that's that's it, really. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all. And if uh, Will oh, can stop, stop the recording. <laughs>